Okay, welcome back. Here we are live on the Alex Mooney Show, 301-694-WFMD. Feel free to call in, 301-694-9363. Here with my good friend Bob Vandervoort, Executive Director of Pro English, which I guess is a pretty simple title. Pro English, you're in favor of English. That's right. That's our goal, (laughs) to make English the official language for government purposes. All right, well, tell us a little bit about yourself and your group. Okay, great, Alex. Well, uh, I'm the Executive Director, as you said, of Pro English, and what we're trying to do is make sure that English stays our common language, and we're pushing legislation at the federal and state level to do just that. We've had a lot of success with that. We've had, there are 31 states right now that have made English their official language, and we're hoping to get the rest of them. So um, with, we have an active organization. If you check out our website at proenglish.org, you'll find all sorts of good information about legislation and action alerts that you can respond to, and we've also got uh, plenty of, of data about how important it is to keep English our official language. So 31 states have this already. That's correct. And Pro English, is there dashes in between that? Is it just P-R-O-E-N-G-L-I-S-H dot org, or is there a that, dash or anything? Yeah, that's it. Pro English, P-R-O-E-N-G-L-I-S-H dot org. All right. Not like pro-life, pro-hyphen life, or but just Pro English straight. All, yep, all one word. And you're, you're a lawyer, too. Yeah, I have a background in, as an attorney, and uh, I've been working uh, last session in Annapolis. I was a legislative director for uh, some good uh, delegates from your state. So. <laughs> well, appreciate all you do. It's good to have a lawyer there with his pro-English. So, you know, I, I use the ATM here in Frederick, and, and I think it's in English. I go to push the ATM. It's in, you want English, Spanish, or French, I think it is. Mm-hmm. I was actually traveling through New York uh, like a month or so ago, and I get to the ATM there. It was like eight languages. It was, uh, it was. I think Chinese was in there, Russian, yeah. uh, a couple others. It just, where does it end? I mean, yeah. Are we going to have fifty languages go to the ATM? Uh, but of course, now your group is for government only. It wouldn't affect what a private bank that's, or. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, basically, we're we're focused on on making it the official language for government purposes. Uh, you know, sometimes if there's like a really egregious case where a, a company is just blatantly, uh, you know, just abusing their their language policies to the detriment of English speakers, we might encourage people to boycott that company or get involved in letting the company know that what they're doing is wrong. But for the most part, our focus is on trying to pass bills at the state and federal level to make English the official language for government purposes. And we feel that if we can do that, that will accomplish the, the main goal of making sure we, we have a common language in this nation that brings us together instead of falling apart as, uh, as we see in other countries. So these ordinances to make English the official language can be done statewide, as you said, 31 states have done, mm-hmm. at the county level and even at the city or municipal level? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, actually, the uh, Congressman Lou Barletta from Pennsylvania, when he was the mayor of Hazleton, he actually got a, a law, an ordinance passed to make English the official language for the city of Hazleton. And we had a hand with our lawyers in helping him get uh, that legislation mm-hmm. drafted. Well, we're on with Bob Vandervoort. He is the executive director of Pro English, which supports English as the official language in this country. And we are live on the Alex Mooney Show, 301-694-9363. I was going I, to—I read in Anne Arundel County, Maryland, they passed this, I believe. Uh, I think it's in there. And I see here a recent uh, article at the Frederick News Post, published January 27th. It is being proposed right here in Frederick right now. I'm not sure if Carroll County, which is quite conservative, has done this. Our listeners are live in Washington, Frederick, and Carroll Counties. I think I, uh, Actually, all three of those counties have— entirely Republican and mostly conservative Republican uh, county commissioners that could do this. Mm -hmm. So this might be a wave that starts to sweep across all of Maryland, perhaps West, especially Western Maryland. There was one dissenting vote in Frederick County, though, on this issue. But from this article on January 27th, says Frederick County has moved one step closer to making English its official language. The Board of County Commissioners decided Thursday to hold a public hearing next month on the proposed ordinance. And residents get a chance to speak on the issue before the vote, so that'll be interesting. Uh, the county now, the county now has a re- resolution in place that proclaims English as the official language, but the resolution is more ceremonial. Okay, the one that's in place now. The law would not change how this is the, the, the county lawyer talking. The law doesn't change legal matters are handled. It's more of a commitment by the commissioners. Uh, not make dramatic changes in day to day operation. 
Commissioner Blaine Young, President Commissioner Blaine Young, said it just sets the tone. There was, however, one dissenting vote. Commissioner David Gray voted against it, and he said there isn't, I don't see anything to be gained. It could be misinterpreted. So in this county, you got to vote to bring something to public hearing, and then after the hearing is when I guess you vote to in, impose it. So what what would be so what would be the opposition? So, so Commissioner Gray thinks something could be misinterpreted. What do what do folks say when they when they counter what you're doing, or is there nobody that counters what you're doing? Well, there are <laughs> there are people that are very opposed to what we're doing, and they think that somehow doing this will hurt immigrants, or they believe that. You know, one of the one of the things that our opponents like to label is that we're somehow English only, that we're an English mm-hmm. only type group, which is just simply not the case. Uh, what official English does is it just means that when the government speaks in its official capacity, it would be speaking in English, and even then there would be obviously some reasonable exceptions to be made if if you know if you needed to have a, a translation made or if you had to uh, warn people about a a pandemic of some kind obviously you know you would have reasonable exceptions to this but this is it's sort of like but currently with our court system uh, the court system operates in english dif- it's just by uh, you know just as a matter of established fact you can't enter in your complaints or your answers in court in in some language other than english and that's that is what we're seeking to do across the government Obviously, the, in the court system, you have translators when the need arrives, but, but you know, filings and briefs and answers and court decisions and opinions, all of that we want to maintain in English. So what's the difference between English only, pushing English only, and your group pro-English, which is English as the official language? So there's a nuance well, there's, there I'm missing. Well, the, I don't think that there are, as far as I know, the, there's, there's several organizations that push to make English the official our official language. Uh, as far as I know, there's no group that would actively advocate for English only. Our, our opponents want to distort our position and say that our position would extend into their homes and the television shows they watch and the language they speak in private. And, and they want to make it seem like we're in this, you know, that there's some sinister plan we have to crack down gotcha. on people talking in different languages in this country and and, and this this would have no effect on what you speak at home or, or how what languages you you use in your private affairs I have a vague re- recollection of a town passing something that seemed to be more of the English only thing I don't know if you can actually pass that as a resolution how how that's even enforceable if two people walking down the street are talking a different language which isn't just Spanish it could be uh, I was I think oh, I, can't, I was walking down the street somebody was talking a language other than Spanish recently. Anyway, and I remember somebody that was opposing it saying, what, if I use the word taco, you know, then uh, that's illegal. So are, are there towns that try to pass English only where you can't even speak another language in that town? I, you know, I'm not familiar with any town that has done that, and I, I, hmm. I tend to think that that might be how our opponents have perhaps I see. characterized or caricatured what a town is doing to mm-hmm. give people the impression that that's what... Some some towns and localities are doing, and and it's unfortunate because it's it's that kind of distortion of what this legislation would do that that I think creates the unnecessary opposition. Gotcha. I did a, a tour in Switzerland, and they speak four languages in Switzerland: uh, a German type di- German 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 basically, French, Italian, and there's a small part of Switzerland which speaks a, na- a local native dialect, native to Switzerland, that is not at all related to Italian, French, or German. And I, I, yeah, forget I think it's the name of Romanish, it. Romanish, Romance. Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. And what's really funny is uh, they're, one of their American heroes is Ben Roethlisberger, the quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers, because Ben Roethlisberger's father is from that part of Switzerland. Oh, okay. was born, or maybe it was his grandfather, but I think it's his father. And Ben, because when I was in Switzerland, they were talking about how Ben Roethlisberger, after having won the Super Bowl for the Pittsburgh Steelers, came to visit his dad's native town of this little five percent of Switzerland area, where they actually is that native dialect of that that very very different language. And I remember these reasonable liberals in Switzerland, who are you know they're much more liberal than me on just about everything, but they were all pretty much frustrated with the fact that 5% of their country spoke a very different dialect and literally really had a hard time communicating with the others. Mm-hmm. And I, they, they were for one language. Mm-hmm. They thought, you know, in order for Switzerland to function, you can't have four different languages. Right. And one of these, and one of them, which 
is the most native of them all because apparently that's that's where the native Switzerland people are. The other ones came in from Italy, from France, and Germany, but these were the natives. But nobody can understand them. And you know the TV, the TV stations, you can't understand it. And you know there's, it's a really big problem that you got four different languages. And you would think it's a no brainer right. just to have one official language. Even immigrants that come to this country, from what I can I can tell aren't coming here expecting the language to be changed to theirs. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a big difference uh, between Europe and America. I mean, in America, like as you, as you allude to, has always had this melting pot tradition mm-hmm. where we, you know, we bring in people from all sorts of different cultures and countries and they speak all kinds of different languages. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, there are hundreds of different languages that are spoken in America just because of, yeah. you know, the, of the different nationalities that people come from. And, and uh, but having one common language is the way we've been able to assimilate all these groups. Mm-hmm. Now, you know the sort of the multicultural, politically correct crowd today feels the word assimilation is a dirty word, and they, <laughs> and they don't like that. Mm-hmm. They want everyone to be in their own little cultural enclaves, and and that's that's actually been a challenge also for pro English because sometimes we have to deal with some really militant multiculturalist people who do not like the idea of people assimilating and speaking a common language. Oh, you used the word multiculturalism. Remember our governor, Bob Ehrlich, uh, said publicly multiculturalism is bunk. Right. Oh, they tried to attack him for it, but he stood his ground and defended it. He said, no, we, we believe in diversity, but having multiple cultures. Right. You know, right. yeah, is it? He isn't, applauded him when he said that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, he, he that, it's interesting how they'll just jump on you, you know, because he used the word bunk or something as mm-hmm. multiculturalism. He, you know, his recent book, which I have read, it's worth reading. He really takes on all these controversies he got into, like his statement about multiculturalism. sporting, yeah, multiculturalism. And, um, you know, it's, it's worth reading. Well, we'll continue this conversation uh, with Bob Vandervoort of Pro English. Uh, this is the Alex Mooney Show. We are live, 301-694-9363. I hope you're listening to us as you're preparing for the great Super Bowl to uh, to come later today. And we'll be back in just a couple minutes, and we'll hope you'll call in and, and uh, ask any questions you might have. The Talk of Mid-Maryland, 930 WFMD. This is Brian Mann. Frederick Air, are you out there? I'm Steve Schmidt, president of Frederick Air, Frederick's only Bryant factory authorized dealer. Go ahead, Bryant Mann. It's starting to get cold out there. I've heard reports of bone chiller being spotted downtown Frederick, but I haven't seen him anywhere. That's because you got to get out there before 10 a.m., Bryant Mann. Maybe if you didn't stay up all night goofing off watching those old Superman and Batman reruns. I'm not goofing off, Steve. I'm, uh, I'm doing research. I'm a superhero, too, you know. Are you afraid your heating system might be sleeping in this winter? Now's the time to get your system checked by the professionals at Frederick Air. If you need a new system, Bryant's heat pumps and gas furnaces are the way to go. And with Frederick Air's home performance testing, every room in your home can be warm this year. Give us a call to see how we can make your home tight and efficient. Frederick Air and Bryant will do whatever it takes to keep you warm this winter. Frederick Air, it's a good call. Call 301-663-0300. Frederick Air. Break out the cigars at Davida Cigars, Maryland's largest cigar store chain and specialty cigar lounges. Davidus is the exclusive home of Castro Brothers Cigars and the Diamond Crown Cigar Lounge. Choose from the best selection of the world's finest hand-rolled cigars and take a break at their Diamond Crown Cigar Lounges, featuring free wireless internet, high-definition TVs, and really comfortable leather chairs. They're in Frederick on Route 40 behind the Outback Steakhouse and in Urbana just off 270 at the Turning Point Center. And visit other Maryland locations at Annapolis, Selicate City, Olney, Shady Grove Road, and Rockville Pike, or visit them at Davidus.com. It's time to relax with a fine hand-rolled cigar at Davidus Cigars. Fox News Frederick, 930 WFMD. Fox News Radio, I'm Jane Metzler. Kickoff, 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Vegas odds makers giving the Patriots a slight edge in Super Bowl 46. The smell of charcoal grills and tailgating is in the air as tens of thousands of fans fill up area parking lots and party before rooting down their teams. Patriots. I really hope we win. We're going to play our game short and sweet. Giants. <laughs> Giants. <laughs> People are having a lot of fun here. Gates are now open and there are still tickets available. Prices have fallen a bit. The cheap 
seats here at Lucas Oil Stadium, going for around $2,000. Fox Radio's Jeff Manasso in Indianapolis. We have a, a pretty big grassroots movement in every single state. Newt Gingrich on CBS has faced the nation undeterred by rival Mitt Romney's double-digit win in Saturday's Nevada caucuses. Romney and Ron Paul leading in the main caucuses. They started yesterday, continuing into next weekend. Fox News, we report, you decide. Your 930 WFMD forecast for mid-Maryland. The cloud cover will linger for the time being, but we're going to get away from talking about precipitation, partly cloudy skies by late, late, and then temperatures will stop overnight down to around 20. On Monday, look for plenty of sunshine and daytime highs in the mid and upper 40s. I'm Danielle Banks on the Weather Channel for 930 WFMD. If you're unable to join us live for The Alex Mooney Show, remember you can find a podcast of each show by logging on to WFMD.com and clicking on the audio vault. Okay, we're back on The Alex Mooney Show. Live, 301-694-9363. Your last chance to call into a, a, and hear from a live show on Sunday about the hot topics going on in Maryland. Uh, we are very pleased to have in studio Bob Vandervoort, Executive Director of Pro English. And we're talking about some of So let me get back to this ATM thing again. You know, I, I heard someone speak, and I, I hate to throw out numbers because I don't want to quote something incorrectly, but I've heard, I've heard it said, I believe, that in New York there's something like a 1,000 ethnicities and we actually had a young lady go through our journalism program that I that I run, the National Journalism Center, a program of Young America's Foundation. And she was from New York City, good conservative. And she was pretty much a melting pot. She was a quarter Chinese, a quarter Cuban, a quarter black, and a quarter white. Very nice lady from New York City. And I was like, this is after multi-generations. Talk about assimilation. I mean, literally one grandparent is from Cuba, one's Anglo-white, one's African-American, and one is Chinese. And, you know, she was... A very nice, attractive lady, mixture of those four. And those ATMs with, with eight, nine, ten different languages on there. And there's pro- I think there's hundreds of languages spoken in New York City. I mean, the true melting pot of this country. Uh, why, I mean, do, do you oppose ATMs having more than one language, for example? Is that, is that you see that as problematic? It's, uh, I, you know, a lot of people have, uh, a lot of people have a, a hard time with that. And, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's not something that our organization typically takes on. I mean, it, it, you know, it could be if you're at, if you're at an airport or in a foreign country that's you're traveling, that may be a you know an advantage to have. That's not a that's really not where we put our energies. I mean, th- there are there are situations where I've we've heard of companies that would you know, refuse to to help a customer who could only speak English and things like that. We would actually. Uh, check out and, and see if we can talk to the managers about that. But, but for the most part, our, our focus is in the courtrooms and in the legislatures and, and in, you know, with the federal government. Because, you know, I mean, here there's three options. If you go right down Route 40, and I'm going to hit the bank on my way out, it's English, Spanish, or French are the three I, I, I recall them having on there. In New York City, they have way more than that. I actually took a picture of it on my phone. And I'll see if I can find it. And... I think private companies are treading on thin ice when they start going to multiple languages because why here do we not have Russian or Polish or another language that people speak? German. I mean, why why is it just English, French, and Spanish? If, right. if you're going to leave English, say, okay, right. we're not going to just going to be an English-speaking company. We're going to give our products. Actually, I don't think government should get involved in this because it's a private industry. So I would hate to see the government going in and to a private industry, a private company, and then taking over and micromanaging them. I tend to oppose right. big government intrusion type of things. But I think from the company's point of view, once you leave English and you start going to other languages, you've opened up the Pandora's box of people complaining that you will. You, right. you, we could all understand if you do it just in English. But since you're going to do it in English and Spanish and French, why not German? Right, right. Well, you know, we, we encourage people to, to write to the managers or let the bank know that, you know, that you're going to take your business elsewhere to, or, or you, you don't appreciate what they're doing. It discourages assimilation. And, and, and there's definitely, there definitely are more things that people could be doing in, in the private sector to encourage mm-hmm. greater English usage and greater participation. And like you say, actually, there's a certain unfairness in having 
singling out certain languages and not others. So mm-hmm. if, if we're going to have a nation which has hundreds of different languages that people speak at home, the fairest thing to do is to have one common language which you use for public government purposes. Yeah, one, one would think. So what else? You, 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 that's a big issue, obviously, promoting English mm-hmm. in official diet. Other, other things your group does? Well, this year we're going to be co-sponsors at CPAC, mm. so we'll be there. That's coming up, right? That's coming up on February 9th, 10th, and 11th, and I'm going to be on two of the panels that are at CPAC. We've got a panel on multiculturalism on... You're going to be on a panel? I'm going to be on two. Awesome. Yeah. One is a pro-English sponsored panel, and that's February 9th at 1230, and we have another panel uh, Saturday morning, which I'll be on, which is at 930 in the morning. CPAC, for those of you who are not familiar, is the Conservative Political Action Committee. has a huge once-a-year gathering in the Washington, D.C. area. 10,000 conservatives of every age are there and talk about how to take this country back for our values. And uh, again, we are here with Bob Vandervoort, if you're just tuning in, of Pro-English, talking about English as the official language. Now, I was wondering how they work it out in Europe. I mean, Europe's trying to get all together, pass this European Union uh, they have the well, what is the the money that they all try to use the, the, the euro. They're all trying to use the euro, kind of have one economy. And there's concerns about how you know the government is starting into a one world government type of thing. But how do they do deal with the languages then? Since there's got to be some language barriers there. Do you have any idea how that works? Well, that's a that's a good question. There's a they do have some problems with that. We actually we're we're blessed that we have one language which we're using here, and it, it helps us. Uh, commercially and economically. Mm -hmm. In Europe, it's my understanding there are 27 official languages Mm. that are designated and and things, bills have to be constantly translated. And when when the EU expands Mm. into another country that speaks another language, that has to be incorporated into the documents that get translated. So they're, they're definitely... They're definitely handicapped by that, both at the in the uh, their commercial sector as well as their their government. Yeah, that sounds like that that would be tough. And I saw somebody wearing a shirt said, "Why should I have to press one for English?" I think it's when you call into companies right, or something. Right. But I wonder if governments do that. Is that something you would post? Someone calls into the, a government agency, and then they would say, "Press one for English, press two for Spanish." Right, right. Well, so I you think, would oppose that. Yeah, then. Uh, the official English legislation, if that if that was passed, would stop that. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily stop it if a bank or your cable company was still doing it. But at least, as far as calling your elected officials or calling a government agency, that would that would that would encourage and, and make it so that they have to be. The calls have to be answered in English. So I'm sure people are going to think this is this is bad to, to have. You know, the liberals will think it's bad. The 31 states that have English as official language, are there any problems? No, there are no problems uh, with it. the The only problem from our perspective is sometimes the states will pass these laws, but then they don't really do much to enforce them. And one of the things we're pushing this cycle is uh, in Tennessee and in Georgia. There are two bills that would make driver's license exams, would, for example, those would have to be conducted in English. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's states that are looking into legislation to, to make sure that you have to know English in order to drive in, in this country. And it, that seems like a common sense position. Mm-hmm. You, know, you need to be able to read the warning signs and what have you. But uh, for a long time, many states have allowed translators to... Uh, to let you take the driver's license exams. I was just checking out the web here for a little bit of information here, and it says that the state of Missouri is considering uh, some of them. Some of the legislators want to bring up this business of uh, requiring that the test only be given for drivers in English. Currently, they have a test that's offered in eleven languages, mm. and you got to wonder a little bit. You know, are you doing anybody a favor by offering them a uh, test? in 11 languages when they have to drive on English roads, so to speak. Yep. Well, they'll change the road signs. You know, that's, that's what some of the more left-leaning states will do, require road signs to have multiple languages. But there's only so much time you have to read a road sign if you right. put it in so many languages. Isn't Tennessee one of the 31 states that has English as the official language already? Uh, I, yes, I believe. So wh- I wonder why they would have to have it for the vehicle test then if it's already official language. you think that would cover... Motor vehicle tests. Well, it's uh, that's a good question, but th- th- you do find that, for example, in Georgia, they they have a, they're an official English state, and 
yet they're still doing the tests in languages other than English. Well, that's maybe the enforcement stuff you're talking about right, then. Right. They have it, but they're not implementing it exactly, thoroughly. Through the government I mean, agency. I mean, obviously you can see, I would, I would say most people would see, if there's a, a court case and a person is maybe here legally, so they're not, not illegal immigrants, someone who's here legally with a permit or work visa or whatever it is, say they've been robbed, and they go to court, and they don't speak good English. They, they speak very poor English. And in those cases, I don't think there's a problem. I don't know if, does your, if, your, if your legislation would prevent this, but is there a problem then having an interpreter uh, to have for someone, someone in that case to access the judicial system? It, it, the, in the court system, there would still be, there would still be exceptions allowed for translators. Yeah, for translators. That's a, that, I mean, it wouldn't be the official language of the courts. Right. It would just be a translator. Right. We have that, and that can actually be a loophole. There was a guy in Montgomery County who was um, molesting his his niece, uh, and and he was a real bad guy. He was from a an Afri- part of some part of Africa, a country in Africa originally, and they used to, they used that as a trick. They said, "Well, this guy speaks a very v- extremely rare dialect in this little town in some country in Africa, kind of equivalent to that Switzerland, uh, the the very native language spoken in Switzerland." So very very few people speak that language. And they claimed that he needed an interpreter, uh, access to an interpreter that spoke this extremely rare language in a faraway land. And some liberal judge agreed, even though this guy actually had a two-year degree at Montgomery Community College. Mm-hmm. So you think if you have a high school degree, much less a two-year degree, and he was an enrolled college student. So he was a two-year degree at community college, yet the court required him to have an interpreter. And, you know, slick defense lawyers, you know, Johnny Cochran types, these slick... Mm-hmm. You know, do anything to get you uh, get you off the hook. And judges have to be smarter than this. You know, you get these liberal, feel good, pansy, bleeding heart liberal judges. Oh, yeah, you know, give the guy an interpreter. It's a trick. And then what ended up happening was they kept delaying the court case over over such a period of time because they couldn't find an interpreter and all this. And then a judge ended up declaring that that uh, he was denied his due, his access to a speedy trial, which is a constitutional right. Mm-hmm. You have a constitutional right to a speedy trial. Well, this thing drug on for like a year or two. And finally, they ruled he wasn't getting his right to a speedy trial, and they threw the case out. Wow. And so, and the big hang-up was that he was supposed to be given this interpreter. So, sure, we want interpreters for both defense as well as prosecution, but uh, you, you, you can't. you, you got to be real careful with that. You know? Right. Well, you, you know, under any, unfortunately, under any kind of law, there's always going to be some people trying to find a loophole or some way to, to, to wiggle out from under it. And mm-hmm. I, we do think, though, that with, with – the legislation we're pushing, mm-hmm. that would get rid of a lot of the loopholes and, and wiggle room that, that currently exists. But there's still always going to be someone who's who's looking to mm-hmm. game the system. Mm-hmm. There's always someone looking to game the system. Well, we appreciate your efforts, and this is one of the tougher states to pass these type of things. Um, as party chairman, I can tell you that most counties, uh, we have, let's see, 23 counties plus Baltimore City, and uh, more than half, I think it's 15, are controlled by Republicans at this point. So you think a county-by-county effort in a liberal-leaning state like this would be more uh, likely to to pass, although it shouldn't obviously be. You're you're obviously not a partisan group. You're a 501c3 tax-exempt nonpartisan group. So it doesn't have to be a Republican effort. I mean, Democrats can believe in in English as the official language as well. Right, and actually the the interesting thing about official English language laws is it's the one issue that gets so much support across party lines. Right. There was a, a Rasmussen poll in 2010 that uh, asked people, do you, fi- do you favor making English the official language? And it's on, we link to it on our website, but it's 85, I think it was 85% of Americans want English to be the official language. And something like, and then the follow-up question: eighty-four percent think that it already is the official language. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't have we don't have a national. Yeah, that's that's well, they think that it is. Yeah. What's well, that, interesting too, there's there's already there's fifty-two countries that have right. made English their official language, which right. is right. which is like um, you know another reason why it's it's not unusual for countries to do this. We'll do a break first. We'll do a quick break here. We have a couple quick commercials, and we'll go to the phones three zero one six nine four nine three six three. We have Michael on hold. And uh, we're, in, we're in studio on the Alex Mooney Show. Be back with you in a second. The Talk of Mid-Maryland, 930 WFMD. 
Jim Palmer back to talk to you about Kosamin ASU. It's been 13 years since my doctor gave me the choice of an eventual knee replacement or taking joint health supplement Kosamin. I chose Kosamin, and so should you. It's the number one orthopedic specialist recommended glucosamin chondroitin sulfate brand. If you want your joints to last, do what I do and take Kosamin ASU. Call 877-COSAMIN. Available at BJ's and leading pharmacies. For reliable, affordable trash removal, call J&J Incorporated Trash Service. Serving Frederick, Montgomery, and Washington counties with both residential and commercial services. J&J Incorporated Trash Service. Call 1-800-465-2350. That's 800-465-2350. And now, back to your Sunday radio addiction, The Alex Mooney Show. Slipping away, sitting on a pillow, waiting for night to fall. Girl in a dream, sitting on a pillow, this is the night. Okay, welcome back. We do have our first caller. We are live, 301-694-9363, talking about English as the official language of this country and other issues. We'll go ahead right to the phone lines. Michael, you're on the line. Yes, uh, how you doing? Good. Hey, just uh, calling. I had a question for Bob there. Uh, good hearing you again. Hey, Michael, uh, how you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Good, thanks. Wondering, um, are there any states currently, I mean, not states, are there any counties in this state uh, that you find, or for that matter, counties that individually uh, in other states will adopt English-only uh, policies uh, successfully? Uh, well, that's a good question, and yeah, we were in Anne Arundel County right now. They're introducing legislation that would declare that Anne Arundel County make English their official language countywide. And as Alex noted earlier uh, in the program, uh, Frederick County is doing the same. So I, I think there, that we may start to see, at least among some of the more conservative counties in Maryland, uh, a move towards adopting official English. And actually, you know, given the challenges in the legislature in Annapolis to get a, an official English bill passed, doing it at the county level is, why, is just the next best thing. A lot of times what it requires simply is, is just a courageous uh, elected official who's willing to do it. Right. Do you think that'll have any effect then on a statewide level eventually or not really? Well, I think you'll find probably uh, the, the counties that are passing them they're, they're, they're probably going to have a few less problems in terms of, of how their counties are run as opposed to the counties that, that don't do this or, and counties, in fact, that, that are focused on you know, multilingual ballots and that sort of thing. They're going to have probably greater problems. I imagine it saves a lot of money to uh, keep it all English, too. <laughs> there, yeah, there certainly is some, th some uh, savings to the taxpayer. All right. Well, thanks for calling in, Michael. All right. And Thank we are, you. We are live, 301-694-9363, here on the Alex Mooney Show. Ten more minutes left in our show. I do want to uh, pivot a little bit, talk about our presidential race and sure. and where they stand on some of the issues and what's going on there. There is some relatively new news because Nevada is taking a long time to count all their uh, precinct results. Uh, I don't know if there's mail-in things are going on or they just take their jolly old time. But uh, with new precincts reporting, there is an updated vote on the Nevada vote count. It is not a winner-take-all state, so the candidates receive delegates for them for the convention based on the proportion of vote they get. And obviously Romney is ahead of the other candidates with 48% of the vote approximately at this time. He's, got, he's received 12 delegates. Uh, next is Newt Gingrich. He was around 23% of the vote, and he's going to get four delegates. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, four delegates. Uh, Ron Paul, 19%, three delegates. Rick Santorum, 11%, two delegates. I had predicted the possibility of a brokered convention last week. I still think that's a possibility. Reading about how Newt has pledged to stay in through Super Tuesday. He thinks he's going to win Texas. I saw something about Minnesota was problematic for Mitt Romney. So, um, you know, I still think this is going to be a very interesting race. Romney's obviously going to show some strength here, as he did in Florida and a couple other states. Uh, we do have another caller we should go to uh, about uh, uh, the, the, the language issue. So um, go ahead. Uh, Miriam, you're on the line. Thanks for calling. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment on, uh, piggyback on what your last caller said. Of course it will save money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the whole point.
point of having one language or a national language to conduct business in and government business in is that it's more efficient. Everybody understands one another, and uh, you don't have to bring in translators and, and uh, mm-hmm. in painting extra road signs and so on. So, yes, it saves money. Oh right, that's absolutely correct. I, I don't. I didn't mean. I don't want to sound like I'm minimizing the uh, the the fiscal benefit from doing that. I think that I think there's a tremendous savings to the to the taxpayer to have everything in one common language. And but I do think there's also there's also other benefits to having it as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Miriam. Thanks for your call. Yes, it definitely saves money. You know, and, and the more you go, it, it, it's it's sort of like the principle of it. Like other issues, you know, if it's okay to, I don't know, uh, have it for one of the languages, and why not two, three, four, and then the savings would be, would be, uh, would be, would be immense. So we are live uh, still on the Alex Mooney Show. About ten minutes left. Uh, it is three zero one six nine four nine three six three three zero one six nine four WFMD. If you want to call in and weigh in on this issue or any other issue, um, appreciate our our guest Bob Vandervoort with Pro English being here. What about so? What about the presidential race? Do, do the presidential candidates understand English should be the official language? Uh, I don't know where Obama is on it, but the, on the Republican side, are they all good on this, or is there some differences there? Well, that's a good question. If if you check out our website again, it's at proenglish.org. In the in the upper right. left hand column of our of the homepage, you'll see a graphic for a, a presidential rankings, and if you click on that, you'll see where we have all the presidential candidates and on the the position of making English official, including Obama. And the interesting thing about this is that right now, currently all four Republican presidential candidates have come out in favor of not only of official English, but also in of getting rid of bilingual and multilingual ballots. So at least on the Republican side, they're, 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 all of them are pretty solid on our right. issue. You'd, you'd think having ballots in one language would go along with English being the official language. Is well, that's two separate issues? Well... You know that's 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 a good question. Uh, Steve King has a bill, HR nine nine seven, which would in Congress right now, which mm-hmm. would make English the official language, and that's that bill. You know, it, it would. The presumption is that once that passes, the it would get rid of multilingual ballots. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's another congressman, Congressman Pete King from New York. He has a similar piece of legislation. His bill more explicitly. Uh, rules out the use of of bilingual ballots hmm. interesting so all the republican presidential candidates are on in the recent debates good. yes in fact we've we've readjusted our grid uh to reflect that the the fact that they are they are more solid on this issue than hmm. and so we're yeah so that's that's um and actually michelle bachman before she dropped out she was a big proponent of it and newt gingrich at most of the debates usually raises it as an issue that he's focused on so so we're encouraged at least that there's there's much more talk this year about official english on <laughs> on the presidential side all right well thank thank you